So let's go ahead and, of course, we're going to, of course, move on to talk about uh, getting into the rise of the labor unions. Uh, of course, that's one of the big things that happens uh, around the Civil War into uh, late 19th century America. So you've got a case where, you know, around the time when Lincoln was assassinated in 1865, there wasn't really any organized labor much. In fact, most of the country was agricultural, you know, pretty much overall. Uh, and um, the average labor earner, you know, did a lot of the backbreaking work for a lot of companies and corporations. And so back in those days, uh, there was low wages, long hours. The average workday was like 12 to 14 hours a day, which is a lot. Um, no, there were no unions hardly at all. I think I'll kind of talk about something that may have existed at one point or another. Uh, there was no health insurance. You didn't get any of that. There was no workers' compensation, workers' comp. So if you lost your job, you got sick, whatever, you know, there was no insurance or something backing you up. Uh, there was definitely no, um, you know, you can't get any, you know, money from the government or anything like that. So that's kind of the way things were, you know, a long time ago. A lot of the people sometimes talk about the working conditions of the 1800s was pretty tough. I know in Europe they called it the so-called dark satanic mills sometimes the way things were. And a lot of early um, worker organizations was more based on labor violence where they had strikes and other, you know, type of violence that they had early on. Uh, example of this radical tradition that kind of started out, um, which people talk about sometimes, is the so-called Molly Maguires. You may have heard of them. Uh, they were the secret organization of Irish American um, miners uh, that were in Pennsylvania. Uh, they were named after a um, named after some woman named Molly Maguire, which is where the name came from originally. And uh, this organization, which was, by the way, illegal, uh, was part of a fraternal lodge of Irish-American miners, uh, which if you want to know the original name, it was called, I believe it's mentioned here, is it? It's called the Ancient Order of Hibernians is what they called it. And uh, they used violence against the mine owners to try to get more rights uh, and all that. Uh, however, it was deemed illegal what they were doing. Uh, and a bunch of their members were arrested. Uh, there were some, I think, that were executed uh, because they had committed violence, including, I think, murdering some workers that were against them. Uh, and um, they were eventually broken up by uh, the Pinkerton Detective Agency. This happened in the around the 1840s, roughly. So that's like the earliest case where I guess they tried to kind of form um, some unions. Uh, at that point, uh, there was one that was called the Knights of St. Crispin. I don't know if you ever heard of that one, but that was considered to be one of the earliest known um, labor union uh, in the United States, uh, which that one uh, formed around 1800. Uh, I think in Philadelphia is where it was. And it was a union of bootmakers or shoemakers uh, that organized originally. They think that. Um, is what maybe influenced other unions to follow later. So you can see they were uh, bootmakers and shoemakers. They organized in the 1870s to oppose competition, but they actually went back to the early 1800s. They were around for a while, the Knights of St. Crispin. Uh, there are also labor strikes. I think there was this one in 1885. There was one in 1877. There was like several of these railroad strikes uh, that happened. And that was actually one of the first strikes that took place, which was among railroad workers, because railroads, railroads and their companies, whatever, took up like almost half the amount of businesses in the whole United States. So they were pretty powerful uh, railroad companies and rail workers just weren't getting paid right. And, and so they wanted more um, workers rights and things like that, better wages, better conditions, etc. Of course, the video talked about the Knights of Labor. That particular group was really one of the first real major um, labor union to really form, uh, which 
was found originally in 1869 uh, by this man named Uriah Stevens. I guess that's who they're kind of showing this picture, Stevens, uh, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S, or Uri Uriah Stevens. Uh, Uriah Stevens was from Philadelphia. Um, he was a, actually a tailor. Uh, and he, the actual original Knights of Labor was called the Order of Knights of Labor, but they were called Knights of Labor uh, for short. Formed after that 1877 railroad strike I told you about. And it became the first real nationwide industrial union. Uh, I tried to put everybody into like one big union, all the workers. It included all races, all sexes, you know, male or female, skilled and unskilled. So I tried to big, form like one big union. Uh, was primarily what the Knights of Labor was trying to do. These are some of the things they wanted to do. They wanted an eight-hour workday, uh, which uh, the Knights of Labor influenced the federal government to adopt an eight-hour workday, which they eventually went to. Uh, they also supported the idea of arbitration uh, instead of strike. They were kind of against strikes. They began to organize strikes, but they, they weren't really in favor of them. But uh, they favored arbitration where they could, you know, obviously ask for better wages uh, by by basically uh, disputing labor reform and labor, you know, payments and how much they were going to get paid and all that. So um, they wanted to settle disputes more peacefully rather than violently is what they wanted to do. Uh, here's some other slide here talking about more about, um, of course, Knights of Labor you want to look at. It's got, of course, things over here that they wanted. So I was an AUL work day. They wanted like workers' cooperatives, even one of their own worker factories. They wanted to get rid of uh, child labor, which was a real, real big, big problem, you know, in the country. Equal pay between men and women. It's all kinds of things that they favored. Uh, the Knights of Labor. They also wanted different races and stuff. So like, you know, not just whites, but they wanted, you know, like a union for people that were black and other races and so on. So they were open to different peoples uh, kind of joining it. It did start out as a secret society. The reason why is because if anybody found you, you were in a union, you got fired. So that's why it kind of was kind of secretive uh, that you were in it or not. Uh, what killed off the Knights of Labor in the 1880s, there was an incident in May of 1886 you may have heard of called the Hay Market Riot or really a fair. And this was where in uh, Chicago's Hay Market Square, uh, they were, um, I think they were mostly protesting. Um, they wanted an eight-hour workday, like workers and it was a bunch of people gathered there, about 1,200 people. And apparently somebody threw a bomb into the crowd and it killed a bunch of police. Uh, kind of like now what's going on with all these riots, it seems like it, it killed a bunch of people. Seven police officers were killed along with several other workers. They never did figure out who threw the bomb. They never, I think, caught the guy. Uh, but several were put on trial and found guilty. You can see here, uh, looks like four of them were hanged. Basically, so it um, kind of led to a lot of mistrust about unions after that. And so it's going to take a while for unions to really become more popular uh, because of what happened with that Haymarket riot or an affair. And it caused the Knights of Labor to decline as a union. Uh, then that union was replaced by another one that was more famous called the American Federation of Labor, which, of course, the video talked about. It was founded by Samuel Gompers. Gompers was its first main union leader and founder of it. He was from uh, Dutch, um, he was kind of Dutch Jewish origins, uh, Gompers, and he was the actual leader of the union from 1886 to 1924. So it was around, he's around quite a while. What's the deal with the AFL? The AFL is a type of union uh, that was formed basically. It was for skilled labor only. And what it did was it divided um, skilled labor into different what we call craft unions. Okay. So what I mean by that is that they saw, they basically, they organized workers based on what their trade was. So that means that uh, if you're a blacksmith, right, then you'll organize as a union based on that. 
So they, they basically it create all these craft unions based on, you know, welders, carpenters, pipe fitters, bricklayers, whatever they are. They began to unionize based on their skill and not one big union. That's kind of how they do unions today. Most unions are based off of like the skill uh, that you have and all of that. So they had a lot of different goals. Well, I guess over here you can see basic ones. They wanted higher wages, improved working conditions. Uh, Gompers ordered walkouts until employers would negotiate new contracts through collective. They wanted collective bargaining is one of the things they started doing. So they just walk out. We're not going to work unless you pay us right, you know. Uh, and so uh, by 19, early 1900s, they've got over a million members. Uh, and it became one of the first great, you know, American unions. You can see later it was later born with that other union called the CIO, which is now called AFL-CIO. Uh, and um, so, yeah, they had like walkouts, boycotts, those kind of things were their strategies. I think he did that rather than, say, strikes, you know. And um, But they weren't a radical union, the AFL. They were more moderate or conservative in the way they did things. Uh, overall, they weren't like the IWW, which I'll get to in a little bit later, which was more radical. So, so yeah, the Knights of Labor were kind of radical, you know, compared to them. And these guys were more uh, moderate and conservative. And uh, what are some things they succeeded in? Uh, eventually, yeah, they helped, you know, AFL was able to force um, pretty much a lot of corporations and companies to go to an eight-hour workday. That's one thing that they did that was probably very famous. Um, and also they were one of the first unions to um, force companies to offer compensation for workers doing like dangerous work or injuries. And so workers' compensation, workers' comp was something that they, you know, were able to eventually get over time. Now, they had a more radical union you may have heard of, uh, which was called the um, Wobblies, which I spelled wrong. And um, anyway, um, wob uh, the Wobblies uh, were originally called the International Workers of the World, or often called IWW. And I don't know if you ever heard of the Wobblies. The Wobblies was this idea of a union where they wanted like a, um, a union for everybody the so-called one big union, I think they called it sometimes. And it was a radical type union that was pro-socialist. They had a lot of people that were communist in it. And even they had anarchists that were in it too, like Antifa would like that. Uh, and um, its leader um, was uh, this guy named William Haywood, who they called Bill, Big Bill Haywood. He was one of the founders of it originally around 1905. And um, they were they were kind of um, radical what, what they wanted to do. They wanted to get rid of capitalism and replace it with socialism. And they wanted a union for everybody, whether it be those that were skilled or unskilled. It didn't matter who you were, man, woman, black, white, whatever. Uh, they wanted to include pretty much everybody uh, in this particular uh, union over time. Uh, why were they called wobblies? Well, it's kind of different, kind of a weird joke about it. Uh, but um, it came from this, uh, there was a story that's kind of weird, but uh, had something to do with some, I forget where it was exactly, but it was it was uh, some Chinese restaurant had something to do with uh, where um, members um, of the IWW used to go eat there. And the guy that owned the Chinese restaurant, he was Chinese himself, um, would give them discounts if they were a member of IWW. And he would tell them, are you with, he couldn't speak English very well. And he would say, are you with, are you with, um, what do you, how he would say it? Are you with I wobble wobble? Like IWW was trying to say. And so the word wobbly stuck. Uh, also wobbly was another term they used too, because uh, they joked that IWW didn't stand for international workers of the world. It stood for I won't work because a lot of them would use strikes a lot to get whatever they wanted. Uh, so that's kind of where the name came from. Uh, another guy that was also involved 
in the IWW, he was considered a co-founder, was Eugene V. Debs. You probably heard of him. And Eugene V. Debs was a big member of the uh, American Socialist Party, which is still around today. Uh, and um, he was originally part of the American Railway Union, uh, which went back to the uh, mid-1900s. And he was involved in the Pullman strike. I do not even heard about that, which was in the 1890s later. Uh, he got involved in that. Uh, and uh, he was a Socialist Party candidate for president five times. He was, I think he's got the record for running the, for the president for the most times. <laughs> yeah, in 1920, he even ran from prison, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, in fact, he ran in 1912 uh, for president uh, and got a million votes. It's amazing, uh, which is really the peak of socialism in the country, I think, in the early 1900s. Socialism is not a popular you know, platform to run on. Uh, we want to run for president, you know. This is pretty much a pro-capitalist country. So, so yeah, he was involved, you know, also with IWW, and uh, he was also involved, like I said, in the American Socialist Party, Eugene V. Debs. We might talk about him later a little bit. All right, next I need to get into and talk about the farmers. Now, the farmers would do something, too. They would organize as well, um, too, uh, try to organize against a big business, which was kind of anti you know, farmer somewhat. And uh, there was this movement that's very popular in the 19th century that was called the Grange. And the Grange, uh, which is the long name, it was called the National Grange of the Order of Patrons of Husbandry. It was founded in 1867, by that picture you saw of that guy, which is Oliver Hudson Kelly, who was a farmer himself. It was like a type of farmer alliance that they formed after uh, the Civil War, it was mostly for uh, social reasons between farmers, the socialized, and then also it was created uh, for to get farmers like updated information on how to practice good farming, you know, methods. Uh, so, because there was really no methods of you know trying to learn how to farm unless you went to college, you know, like say to like an A and M school, which maybe you couldn't do. Uh, and so part of the uh, whole thing was to educate people, socialize, even religion together. Uh, they also formed cooperatives together to help with farming and so on. And it later led to so-called Granger laws, as they call it later, uh, to, to help regulate the railroads because the railroads didn't treat the farmers good, you know, about this. Uh, if you're a farmer, you want to ship something to a local market they would charge you more money, what they call a short haul, uh, compared to someone like Andrew Carnegie or somebody shipping something across the country, what they call a long haul, they'd give them a discount. So it later led to like court cases, which I'll talk about later, like Wab Wabash versus Illinois and so on, that eventually would try to help out farmers uh, and all that. Uh, here's another one right here, of course. Uh, of course, right there. So, yeah, the government wasn't helping people out. I mean, they weren't helping farmers out, you know, in the Midwest uh, and all that. And um, the uh, Wabash versus Illinois, which I just talked about, uh, was a famous Supreme Court case uh, that came out. And uh, it was like one of several. There'll be another one called Munn versus Illinois that was also in favor of farmers as well. Uh, that one, of course, created these so-called Granger Laws, uh, which was supposed to um, regulate interstate trade, uh, make it more legal uh, towards farmers. Uh, however, what's going to happen, you'll see later, is that the, a, lot of the, a lot of the railroads won't, you know, uh, support it. Uh, and so it's going to eventually take an act to fix that, which will be the Interstate Commerce Act, which I'll get to later. So it's kind of a big problem with with um, farmers and railroads at that time. Uh, another thing that happened too is that the, uh, a lot of these farmers created what they call farming cooperatives uh, to help each other out. This happened in the eight, late 1800s. Farmers began to pull all their resources together uh, to help each other uh, learn how to farm. Uh, that included supplying like seed, fertilizer, fuel, machinery, which they could buy or rent. Uh, from cooperatives. 
And uh, it was something that was very vital because uh, also it gave them also information on how to farm in general. And that led to what they call agricultural extension services being formed uh, throughout the country, which a lot of these are later based on and associated with universities and colleges, uh, which was part of the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture. And um, example of this is uh, in Louisiana, you've got the LSU Agricultural Center uh, is associated also with the Louisiana Cooperative Extension Service, uh, which has these county agents uh, in each parish, you know, that'll go out and help farmers where they have information that they can help to educate farmers uh, in general. I actually used to work for the Cooperative Extension Service years ago, believe it or not, work for the 4-H program, which is part of it. Uh, and uh, anyway, the, the 4-H was like something that kind of came out of that with the Cooperative Extension Service uh, in the USDA. Uh, and uh, 4-H was kind of like a youth organization that was based on agriculture, you know, and it taught like young kids how to farm and other things like that and raising animals. And, and uh, that started in the early 1900s. So there's all kinds of methods they're trying to do to, to teach people, you know, about agriculture or the importance of agriculture on uh, farming and so on. Uh, then they had the Interstate Commerce Act, of course, that came out. Of course, I need to talk about, yeah, that Munn versus Illinois court case I just talked to you about. It came out around 1877. The, the Supreme Court ruled that the state legislatures had a right to regulate businesses that affect the public. The only thing is, is that the railroad companies wouldn't follow it or they would uh, exert enough pressure on the state legislatures uh, to basically have them repealed or whatever. And so Congress in 1887 passed the Interstate Commerce Act. So it made it illegal for railroads to do a bunch of things like pooling arrangements. You probably wonder what that is. Uh, pooling arrangements is where railroads competed against each other and they um, set freight rates on agreed amounts. So they might have a similar rate that they might all set. Uh, and then the second one, it, may, it made it illegal for railroads to offer special favors or rates to certain customers, like say Andrew Carnegie versus say Mr. Joe Farmer. So they can't do that. It has to be a similar rate. Uh, there can't be different rates between a long haul and a short haul. They have to be the same, uh, no matter. Uh, also, they can't charge unjust or unreasonable rates, so like too much or whatever for something. Uh, and then also they must print and display their freight rates, what it's going to cost. Um, so everybody's, the public's got to know that. Also, yeah, they, had, they eventually led to, of course, it set up a, what they call the Interstate Commerce Commission. But that was Interstate Commerce Commission had the authority to investigate railroads for any unfair business practices. So they break any of these rules here. Uh, they could be investigated for it. So this really led to a crackdown on the railroads, you know, having these illegal practices. It really helped farmers a lot you know, throughout the country and other people that were, I guess, had smaller companies or whatever. Because most of the people that had an advantage with the railroads were big business, you know, like the corporations and Carnegie and, you know, all those other guys that we talked about, capitalists. Uh, the other big thing that happened, of course, uh, was the, uh, in, in the late 19th century, there was a problem with, like, there being, like, uh, a lack of money, um, like, like, Scarcity of money was a big problem, especially after the Civil War. Uh, if you know about it, during the Civil War, the North had printed a lot of paper money, which was called greenbacks, which kind of looked like this, basically. Uh, however, they started withdrawing the money uh, by the 1860s and 70s. They, got, they withdrew a lot of the paper money. They brought back what they call hard currency, you know, made from metal, like, you know, basically uh, gold or silver. Uh, and so uh, there was a lack of um, paper money. And so the, there's a case where there was a political party uh, that comes in, the Grange fails, like they, then they start breaking up uh, the Grange. A lot of the farmers 
start becoming political. And so they joined this political party that's called the Greenback Party, which is in favor of cheap paper money. Uh, and um, here's a little picture here. Those are some of the founders of it. I think one of those guys is um, James B. Weaver. I think the guy on the left is James B. Weaver. And um, it was called different names. It was either called the Greenback Party, and then they had another name they sometimes called it, which was the Greenback Labor Party. Because you had the labor people that joined it. Uh, the farmers were in it uh, and so on. So it's like this uh, working class type farmer political party. And uh, this party is important because the Greenback Party is the party that kind of leads into what they call the populist movement uh, in the late 19th century or the so-called populist party. Uh, and um, so it formed in the 1870s about, you can see all the groups that were in it. Yeah, labor organizations all joined it like unions. Farmers were in it. People that were pro-silver, pro-paper, money, that kind of thing, uh, were all in it. Probably more like some of the Democrats joined it, but not Republican uh, that were in it. They even ran uh, candidates for presidency, like James B. Weaver, I think, ran one time as president of the Greenback Party, uh, which I forget what year that was. But... Um, um, the silver issue was a big thing. Like if you study about silver uh, in the 1800s, people thought that was a form of cheap money that they wanted to either coin or use as um, money, I guess a, a metal to back paper money as a whole. And what happened was in uh, 1873, the federal government withdrew paper money. This was under uh, unless he says Grant's administration. I think a lot of it had to do with like the depression that was going on in the 1870s. And the federal government stopped coining silver money, silver coins and all that, which were kind of rare at that time. So people call it the so-called crime of 73. A lot of people like farmers and workers were kind of mad about that. They would retrieve all the silver. Um, now they had what they call the Bland Allison Act. Uh, which was passed. Uh, it was actually uh, passed over Rutherford B. Hayes' veto. And this uh, forced the government to um, coin silver at a rate of like something like two to four million uh, per month uh, at a ratio of 16 to one silver to gold. So you have 16 to one. Uh, and um, the only thing about it was the federal government didn't do it. They, I think they, they started buying up all the silver or whatever, uh, which it's like they were buying about 4.5 million uh, ounces of silver a month, but they didn't put it in circulation, though. That's the only thing they really didn't do, uh, which people weren't happy about that either. So so anyway, so, so there's definitely a, this whole money issue and silver and paper money uh, were big, big issues that, you know, led to uh, the rise of what they call populism that, of course, came later uh, after that. And um, all these farmers started forming these um, alliances all over the place. Uh, there was the so-called Northern Farmers Alliance, the Northwest Farmers Alliance, the Southern Farmers Alliance uh, that they had uh, as well. So they had them all over the place. Uh, these, and these, this was not social like it was before. These were more like political uh, type organizations because uh, the federal government wasn't listening to farmers. They weren't you know, trying to help them like they should. And um, there was this one lady on the bottom. I won't talk about Emory, but there was a one lady called Mary Elizabeth Lee. She became one of the main leaders of the farm alliances. It led to the rise of popular. She was like real popular uh, as a leader. Uh, and um, she was really involved. Uh, but yeah, she was one of their main their main uh, leaders. I think I had a picture of her of least, didn't I? There she is right there. But she told the farmers, you need to raise less corn and more hell. You know, try to get more help, you know, from the federal government and all that. Uh, and... Um, 
So you can see a lot of them, you know, you know, emerge from the Grange. You know, a lot of these farmers started, you know, forming these political alliances uh, and all of that. And um, they tried to elect people that were pro-farmer, pro-agricultural. So a lot of your state and local federal elections, uh, they started electing people uh, to office uh, throughout the United States. Uh, at one point, they controlled eight state legislatures. They had 47 representatives in Congress by the 1890s, uh, these pro-farmer type candidates uh, that came to power at that time. So uh, they had all these alliances uh, all over the place. And um, these are some things they wanted, which are very interesting uh, about the farmer alliances. They wanted a graduated income tax, which I'll get more into later. Uh, that, of course, is also later known as the 16th Amendment. Uh, they wanted cooperatives, like I told you. They wanted low-cost insurance uh, for everything, tougher bank regulations. They also wanted government ownership of the railroads, which sounds like a form of socialism, which the populace wanted later uh, as well. So it's all kind of the same thing, which it becomes basically one big party later. So what happened was by the 1890s, uh, these farmer alliances eventually form into a political party uh, that has a name. It's either called the People's Party or the Populist Party, which they think formed in 1892. It's about when it is. And um, here are some things, of course, they wanted. They wanted an increase in money supply. So they either want you know cheap paper money uh, backed by you know silver, um, things like that. Graduate income tax, of course, as well, later the 16th Amendment. They wanted some kind of federal loan program to help out farmers, uh, basically. Here's one that's very interesting. They wanted uh, the populist party, which will be later. You have the election, uh, direct election of senators by popular vote, which is later the so-called 17th Amendment. They're the ones that brought that up first. They also wanted single terms for president and vice president, which never really happened. They did want something which, of course, they were the first to bring up was the secret ballot, or we call the Australian ballot that they'll have later that they do now. Uh, and um, that's something that, of course, becomes something real later. They want an eight-hour workday, restrictions on immigration, because immigration was hurting the farmers and other laborers uh, in the country. And so this political party became very attractive to like farmers and the working class uh, throughout the United States. In the 1892 election, they actually got 10% of the vote. Um, you read about that when uh, Grover Cleveland uh, defeated Benjamin Harrison in the 1892 election. Uh, they ran a guy named uh, James B. Weaver as uh, president. Uh, the so-called populist party, uh, but they lost. They weren't even close to getting votes uh, and winning. Uh, but it was the beginning stages of um, populism in the United States, which was real popular in the 1890s. So, yeah, James V. Weaver, he was a presidential nominee. And, and he, of course, did win in 1892, uh, but it's going to later lead to populist ideas uh, that'll spread. And over time, what's going to happen is, if you know about this, populism will eventually become what they call progressivism, and that'll become a big thing later, uh, the late 1890s and into the early uh, 20th century as well. Yeah, here's some other stuff they wanted too. Uh, they wanted government control of utilities. That's interesting about that. A uh, system of national warehouses uh, to help out farmers. Um you know, grain storage facilities, creameries, uh, those kind of things uh, were some other things uh, they were in support of as well. So there he is right there, James B. Weaver. Uh, he was, the, like I said, the presidential candidate in 1892. They did win a bunch of congressional seats. That's, I guess, one thing they got out of it, I guess, the most uh, was that. Uh, but he didn't win you know, the presidency. Uh, but it's interesting that they were able to pull that many people. Uh, I think the Populist Party or People's Party 
that was the most votes of any third party that ever got that many votes so far in American history. I think they've had more after that, but that's the most that any third party had done uh, so far in American history. So that was all what, well, the, you know, the peak of the farmers would be here and I guess in kind of in 1896, but uh, eventually they'll decline and progressivism will come in later uh, among the Democrats and Republicans. They'll kind of take up the same kind of causes. Here's a map showing you the presidential election of 1892, but basically Cleveland defeated Harrison uh, in all of this. But you can see all those, you know, those areas in green. You can see all those in green were areas where the populist party, you know, did fairly well. I forget how much they got, but I think they got... Um, I want to say around 22 electoral votes or something like that is what they got, which was pretty good. Um, so that's, you know, I think the the most I think that third party had gotten at that point uh, overall. Uh, now, the only thing that happened, though, um, was that they had a depression there. But right after Grover Cleveland came in, 1893, uh, there, was the, there was the great, there was a depression that was real bad. And uh, Cleveland blamed uh, this thing called the Sherman Silver Purchase Act, which had been passed uh, in Congress under Benjamin Harrison. Uh, the Silver, Sherman Silver Purchase Act was an act passed by Congress, which the farmers and other pro-silver people wanted the federal government to buy more silver, uh, the back, you know, currency and all that. And they believe it caused the, the, the depression. And so he had it repealed, uh, which I think they did right after he came in. Uh, and this angered a lot of populists because they thought it was the opposite. They thought that the problem was is that they needed more silver, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and so that led into the 1896 election. The 1896 election in uh, American history uh, was all about the money issue, you know, the pro-silver versus the what they call the pro gold standard. So there's a big debate about you know which which they should choose, you know, the economy uh and, and money and all that. And uh the Republicans favored the gold standard, what they call sound money. The Democrats wanted the silver standard, the cheap money, uh, basically. Uh there are different candidates of course running in this election, the two main ones, of course, that would run against each other that were famous was William Jennings Bryan. Uh, he ran on the Democratic side. And then you had William McKinley, uh, who was, of course, on the Republican side. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, you can see here, here's some stuff they had. Uh, the Democrats were backed up by a lot of people that were populous. Uh, they had a lot of people are Southerners, people that were pro-silver. Those are the kind of people. A lot of the farmers, you know, pretty much backed uh, the Democratic side of it. Uh, and then on the Republican side, it was mostly people that were pro-business, professionals, skilled factory workers. Some of the more prosperous farmers, I guess, were more the other side uh, that were there. So you have both these sides uh, involved. Here are the candidates, of course, they had in 1896. Uh, you had William Jennings Bryan. Bryan, of course, was from Nebraska. He was a very good orator, very good speaker. Uh, they called him the great commoner. He spoke to a lot of people throughout the rural areas of the Midwest and West. He was very popular. Forget how many speeches he gave when he was president. He gave like something like 600-something speeches to 5 million-something people in like 27 states. Um, when he ran in 1896. Uh, he's also known for running for three times for president and losing, <laughs> by the way. He was a peace activist. He was also an anti-imperialist because McKinley was pro-imperialist. Uh, he was later Woodrow Wilson's Secretary of State, and you may have heard of him. He was involved later in the Scopes trial. I'll probably talk about that later, which is in the 1920s, uh, which had to do with the whole uh, teaching of uh, Darwinism in Tennessee. I'll, I'll get to that later. But he was involved in that case as a lawyer uh, later on. 
Uh, Brian, eventually what happened was at the uh, Democratic National Convention in 1896, he uh, gave a speech, which is called the Cross of Gold speech, uh, where he criticized, denounced the bankers and a lot of the big business of being pro-gold standard over silver. Uh, and that particular speech um, eventually led to him being nominated as the Democratic candidate. He was a dark horse. People, very few people knew who he was. He was very young. I think he was 36 years old. I think the minimum age is 35 to be president, uh, basically. And a lot of the populace joined him. Uh, and the populace, um, they, um, it was kind of a compromise with the populace. They brought in Tom Watson, who was from Georgia, who was a populist, pro-farmer guy. Uh, he was his vice presidential nominee uh, that was with him. So that was basically, uh, you know, and he talked about this idea of, you know, the cross of gold speech. He was a very, very famous uh, speech where he said that he felt like bankers were crucifying people because of, you know, the gold standard and all of that. And it's what kind of basically made him real popular. Uh, McKinley, on the other hand, was pro-business, wanted to protect the big business, you know, the capitalists and all of that. Uh, and he was from Ohio, uh, and he wanted, like, high tariffs to uh, help out people, which a lot of farmers probably didn't like. Uh, and so um, he would he would pretty much run for president. And, oh, interesting thing about uh, McKinley. McKinley was one of the last uh, guys to run for president. And didn't really campaign. You know, kind of like Joe Biden sitting in his basement or whatever. McKinley, you know, was like the same thing. He was just sat on his back porch and just like, you know, hey, you know, come see me and I'll give you a speech. And so that's what they did. They actually brought people to him <laughs> where he would just give speeches like at his house, you know, that kind of deal. And um, part of why McKinley won the election was he had a campaign manager who was pretty good from Ohio named Mark Hanna, may have heard of him, H-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. He uh, was able to uh, raise about two, he raised $3.5 million uh, for McKinley's campaign. And Brian was only able to um, raise $300,000. $300, so he out campaigned him way more, 10 times or more. That's why he won, uh, you know, because he had all this money that he had in his back pocket. So 1896 results, of course, uh, like I said, McKinley beat Bryan. And so the popul mo populist movement kind of crashed uh, because of that, uh, what occurred. But what's going to happen, though, is that the populist ideas are going to eventually spread. It's going to spread to the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, McKinley later is going to have a, a VP he'll have in 1900. 1901, that'll be Teddy Roosevelt. And Teddy's pretty, you know, uh, pro-progressive type, you know, president will have later. Uh, they'll have other progressive presidents like Woodrow Wilson on the Democratic side. Uh, that'll be there later. But a lot of the ideas of the populace will eventually come back and it'll be part of the progressive movement. But I'll talk about that probably next week and not today. All right, so... Um, I think I've got all the review here. Am I missing some stuff here? I'm trying to think here. I got something missing here. I don't have the review material in here for some reason. Um, I guess I didn't include that in here for some reason. I guess I'll have to do that next week uh, and do that because it's not in front of me um, right now. But I think what I'll do is on Tuesday I will review uh, and then um, – I'll, of course, be posting your exam uh, after Tuesday's class is what I'll do. I'll just do that because I'll talk. I'll go ahead and review the um, lecture I did today, labor movement, uh, the populist movement, uh, and then the farmer alliances. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll go ahead and cover some on progressivism, just maybe a little bit on progressivism is what we'll do. Uh, and then. Uh, that'll be it uh, for that class. We probably have a shorter class probably on Tuesday, uh, likely. So uh, that's it for today. Uh, before we go, uh, if anybody is up here on, I guess, on YouTube right now, 
If you have any questions, let me know. Um, if not, um, yeah, that was on there. I knew that. But uh, if not, um, um, just let me know later about the lecture. Um, I think that was on. I knew that was on there still. Sorry about that. But um, we do have some uh, uh, assignments, don't forget, that are due coming up, uh, which um, – I guess I messed up on that. I might have to redo that later. That's a problem. But um, don't forget about those two assignments, which are due. You've got the um, assignment on um, the uh, Little Bighorn, the Battle of Little Bighorn uh, Battle, well, Custer's Last Stand. Uh, and then you've also got the, uh, uh, I think it was that Canvas quiz on the Gilded Age that y'all have got as well to complete as well. Uh, so that that basically um, are the two big assignments I think you've got right now. Uh, and then, of course, next week, I'll probably have some kind of exam coming up for you uh, that'll be there uh, as well. So that's it for today, uh, lecture-wise. It's a little shorter lecture today. But uh, on Tuesday, I'll um, next week, I'll review uh, for y'all's exam the last material we have. And then... I will uh, talk maybe a little bit about the progressives, and then uh, I will give you all y'all's exam, which I will post in quizzes, okay? I think that's pretty much it for now. If you have any questions, let me know later uh, about this lecture or any other lecture uh, previously. So that's it for today. I'll see y'all uh, next week. Hope y'all have a good weekend um, coming up. <laughs>